Thank you everybody for joining. So this is a session about plastic pollutions and solutions of the World Resource Forum. Um, I am Natasha Schmidt. I am a scientist at the Climate and Environmental Research Institute, NILU, and I'm co-chairing this session today together with Miguel Laceras Hernandez. And uh, we're very happy to have all of you here. Um, we think it will be a very nice session um, with interesting speakers. So just a few words about how all of this will happen. Um, we have five speakers in total. The first speaker will be a keynote speaker, and uh, it is possible to ask questions using the Q&A after each presentation. Um, we have just one or two minutes for some short questions. And in the end, we have a plenary discussion where we hope to get uh, some more questions from the audience and a good discussion between the speakers. Um, so welcome, and I would like now to give the floor to our first speaker who is Lars Mortensen. Um, he's a circular economy expert at the European Environment Agency, and who will, he will introduce the topic of plastics and the circular economy to us. So Lars, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Natasha, and good morning to all. Good to see you all here. Uh, I will talk about plastics and the circular economy and how to make the most of plastics as a resource and in the plastic pollution. And I will share my my slides just in a second here. Before I start, maybe just a few words about where I'm from. So I work at the, the European Environment Agency. We are an EU institution and our mandate is to, to monitor Europe's uh, environment. And we are the organization who collects, for example, all climate data, all water data, etc. Uh, I'm responsible for work on plastics, uh, textiles, uh, and uh, consumption. I would like to make uh, three points this morning. First of all, I would like to talk about the amounts of plastics that we see worldwide. Secondly, I would like to talk about the environment, resource, and climate impacts from plastics and the need for research, because we need a lot of more knowledge and research on this. And finally, talk a bit about the EU and the global policy processes that have happened and especially are happening actually right now as as we speak. So maybe starting with point one, this is uh, no, common knowledge, I think, to most that our global plastic production is increasing very rapidly. Uh, we're reaching uh, 500 uh, million tons uh, and more than half of all the plastics ever produced has been shown to be made since uh, two, 2000. So these are really, really huge numbers and we expect a uh, a continued uh, increase in, in the plastic production. The question is where this uh, plastic production happens. Uh, a lot of it has happened previously and is happening in, in North, and, North America and in Europe, but what we've seen in the last uh, 10, 15 years is that there's been a rapid growth in production in China especially, but also in the rest of Asia. And you can see that with this figure that China has now reached uh, over 30% of global production of, of, of plastic. So, so, so that is, uh, is shifting. What happens uh, to the plastic uh, after we use it is that it becomes waste. And in, in the EU, we have and are still exporting a lot of our, our plastic waste. This graph shows uh, in orange, uh, no, basically in blue, how much we have exported outside the EU uh, to Asia, mainly to China, and how much we're exporting inside the EU. And what you can see here is basically as a, a China had a ban on imports of, 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 of plastic waste from the EU, we've actually shifted the, the, the exports. So we now trade the exports within the EU countries instead of, and we are exporting less and less, uh, less to Asia. And I think that makes good sense because we should be able to handle our, our plastic waste uh, ourselves. You can you can argue and, and recycle as much as possible. So that leads me to the, to the second point, the, the impacts from plastics and, and, and the need for research. On the impacts, I would like to show you this figure and talk you through it to the, to the extent I can. So this shows, uh, this is an illustration of the plastics value chain from extraction to production, to use and to, and to, the, to, the, to the end of life basically. And what you can see here is uh, on the left side, 
you know, extraction and production of plastics, uh, both fossil fuel based plastics and bio based plastics um, has a lot of impacts, especially on fossil fuel use and the greenhouse gases uh, from plastics. Plastics is part of the, 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 the chemical sector, and we've tried to estimate how much the greenhouse gas emissions are, and I'll show you that in a second. Then, of course, plastic is used for many different goods and services, electronics, textiles, paints, vehicles, buildings, uh, packaging, of course, and, and that has quite a, a significant number of effects on human health, expo exposure to, to toxic substances, uh, uh, etc. And the way we can diminish that is by longer use, reuse and repair. But of, also, as you know, the, the end of life phase uh, has a lot of impacts. Uh, we hear a lot about the, the, the marine litter and the microplastics, which is really growing uh, as a problem, but also greenhouse gases from incineration and landfill is a, is a huge problem. So as you can see, it's a very complex sector and system. The environment and climate impacts are very complex and it is, will also be quite complex to solve them, although this is definitely possible. So we've looked into the greenhouse gas emissions from the plastic value chain, uh, estimation of over 200 million tons uh, in just one year. And what we showed here is basically that over 60% of that comes from the production phase. So that includes extraction and the production, 20% from conversion and then around 18% from, from, from end of life. So that's where the CO2 emissions uh, are. Uh, the microplastics is of course another huge issue that we are also looking into. Basically, microplastics comes from two types of resources, the land-based sources on the right-hand side here and the sea-based sources on the, on, on the left-hand. And what we've tried to illustrate here is that the microplastics come from land-based resources from the litter, a lot from the clothing, from the coatings and the paint. We've learned a lot from artificial turfs like football fields, from the tires to tire abrasing, road markets, uh, pellet losses, etc. So there are many sources. There's also quite a lot of sea-based resources from the discarded fishing gear uh, and the, the marine litter uh, in, in particular. And then in terms of the global waste management, I wanted to show you this, that the OECD produced for that global plastics outlook that shows in red here that 46% uh, of global waste, plastic waste is, uh, is, is landfilled. Uh, uh, 17% is incinerated, only 15% is recycled, and actually 22% has been estimated to, to be mismanaged. So we have a huge challenge on the plastic waste treatment as well. Some research and knowledge need. This is really an area that we've not known about or dealt with so many years. So we really need reliable and publicly accessible data on plastics production and consumption, impacts from the whole value chain, environment and climate, Actually, a lot of the data is now owned, is in private hands, and an organization like us, we don't even have access to it. So, so plastics data is not publicly available at all. We also need to have much more knowledge on, on the impacts of humans of the plastics and the microplastics. We know very little about that. And we also need to have more research on the policy options, what can be done, and what the effects will be of that. So I hope many researchers will, are, more and more researchers are focusing on that and giving us useful research for that. And that leads me to my final point. Except that I, my again, my slides are not moving. And my third point is about um, is about the EU and the global policy processes. Can you still hear me, Natasha? Yes, we can still hear you. I think you might need to do the same thing as before. I don't know. It's moving again. So the EU and global policy process. Yes, just to start with. We've, in the European Environment Agency, identified some pathways towards more sustainable and circular plastics. And those are three pathways. One is basically smarter use of plastics, also less use. Uh, that could uh, reduce the environmental impact through the value chain. Increase circularity, basically using plastics for longer, reusing and, and recycling plastics. And the third pathway is to use more renewable materials, so bio-based plastics. So we think a combination of those pathways could contribute to, to more circular and, and environmentally friendly plastics. Something wrong with the system here, my slides simply keep blocking. I'm going to start, I'm going to continue to walk, walk you through and then uh, I'll get the slide to turn as I can. So what we basically have 
in the EU is that we have an EU strategy on plastics uh, that was agreed some years ago. Uh, it contains uh, some priority areas, uh, improving the economics, uh, the, the, the curbing of plastic waste and littering, investments, etc. And what we have is, of course, the single use plastics directive uh, from, from, from the Commission, which is the big tool we have. Also, you may have seen that recently the Commission came out with a communication on bioplastics, on bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics that came out in November last year. And what we're waiting for from this Commission is, uh, is the policies on microplastics, which has been postponed a few times and are expected for a uh, third quarter, of, so this quarter of this year. So, so we're looking forward uh, to see that. Then I wanted to mention, while I'm still trying to make this work, that uh, there is a big uh, global process on plastics happening now. The uh, negotiations of, 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 a, of a, a global treaty on plastics. I'm involved in that as part of the of the EU uh, team uh, supporting those negotiations. Uh, there'll be a meeting in next in Nairobi uh, this year. And actually a zero draft of this global treaty was developed by the Secretariat and came out uh, yesterday. So I can share that with you if anybody's interested. That will basically uh, be a legally binding global agreement on plastics that uh, hopefully will have uh, a, a lot of effects. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I really apologize for the problems with my slides. Uh, I don't know why that happens, but um, I hope you got the message in any case. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Lars. I think you can see the slides now from my screen. Is that right? That is correct. This is the slide about right. the about the, the uh, about the EU plastics uh, uh, strategy, and then there was a slide about the about the global processes as well. This one here. Yeah. So I will just leave it on for a few more seconds so people have the time to look at it. Yeah, maybe just on this uh, UN International Negotiation Committee. I think this is a really important process. It's basically the only environment agreement being negotiated at the UN right now, really trying to address this. We are negotiating questions about, you know, shall we cover the whole value chain or just, you know, the, the, the litter part, uh, the production and consumption, shall it cover a, a, all goods and services that has plastic in it? Uh, it will be a legally binding agreement, but will it be with targets? How will it be monitored? So it's really an interesting process. And I would like to encourage you all to engage to, to the extent possible. Of course, from the EU side, we're pushing to get a, an, a, as an ambitious agreement as possible. But there are other countries pushing in, 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 in other directions, uh, you can say. And especially the, a lot of the oil producing countries are seem less interested in, in, a, in an ambitious agreement. That was very clear when we met last time in uh, in, in, in Paris in, in, in May. Yes. Um, thanks a lot, Lars. This was really interesting and really allowed us to have a great overview of the problem, actually. And yeah, that it concerns a lot of different things from, of course, microplastics that a lot of people talk about, but also CO2 emissions and um, recycling. And it was also nice at the end to get uh, some first insights into some solutions also as well. Uh, since this is part of our topic today. Um, so I would like to remind people that there's the possibility to use the Q&A to ask questions um, to each presentation and then also in the end for the plenary discussion. There are no questions in there yet. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but which do not only concern you last, but maybe also the other speakers. So I would wait until uh, the end of the session, if that's OK. And um, yeah, then I would just continue with the next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Nicola Beaumont. She's leading the Sea and Society team at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. And she will give us some insights into her works on the costs of plastic marine litter for the society. Um, please, Nicola. Thank you, Natasha. That's great. Um, I'll just share my screen. So is that good? Can you see OK? Yes, thank you. Great. OK, um, so thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, Nicola Beaumont and I want to share with you today some of the work that we've been doing, uh, looking quite broadly at marine plastic pollution. This was a collaborative piece of work. Um, there's a, a long list of names here at the bottom, so uh, I wanted to just 
make that very clear to acknowledge those people as well. I think one of an important place to start is to consider the complexities we just heard from Lars of the plastic pollution issue. In order to address this, we're going to need to take a whole host of different responses and interventions. This can be anything from reducing our use of plastic and avoiding plastics, uh, which is a good place to start. But clearly, plastics are incredibly useful as a, as a material, so we, we can't just focus on this one alone. We can also look at replacing and substituting plastics with alternative materials and developing plastics which are more biodegradable and compostable. We can look at recycling and reusing plastics um, in order to improve our collection of these things and, and to really close that loop and aim towards that circular economy, which we just heard about. Importantly, we can look at improving our disposal systems. One of the issues with plastic is that in, in many places it is not disposed of in a way that is comprehensive. And we then see this leakage of plastic into the environment causing the marine plastic pollutions, causing the marine plastic pollution. So we really need to think quite carefully about how we dispose of this waste. And the final option is to look at cleanup and remediation. So this is actually going out into the environment and taking the plastic out of the environment. Um, and there's a whole host of ways to do this, including some quite innovative nature based solutions. So one of the things we've been working here at the Marine Lab on is using mussels and shellfish to filter the water to filter out the microplastics. And there's a whole whole suite of other options that are in development in this area. Now, I think in order to address the problem, like I said, we need to use these comprehensive list of measures and the solution to the problem will most likely be using a mix of these. But I think to drive this process forward, it's important that we understand not just the ecological impacts of the plastic, but the social impacts and the economic impacts as well. And that's the work that we've been focusing on. I think that for some people, just hearing ecological impacts of plastic, so just hearing that the plastic is affecting our whales, our dolphins, that isn't enough really to drive them to make the changes that need to happen. It's only when you start to talk to them about how it affects humans and how it affects our well-being that you can really drive a shift forward. Now, this uh, research was very much focused around using what we call an ecosystem service approach. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what an ecosystem service is, an ecosystem service very simply is the benefit which we get from the marine environment. And this might be anything from the fact the environment takes up our carbon, so having a positive effect um, on our climate. It might be that the environment provides us a place for recreation and tourism, or it might be the fact the environment provides us with food. And the, the idea of this ecosystem service approach is that we can understand what those ecological functions mean in terms of human well-being and benefit. So it's very well to say, oh, we, we need a lot of biodiversity, but the ecosystem service approach then explains why that biodiversity is really important, because it means that our oceans take up our CO2, they provide us with food, they provide us with recreation. So it sort of translates, if you like, those ecological implications to social and economic implications and this is what we call the ecosystem service approach so for this research we took a three-step pluralistic approach we knew quite a lot already about the sources of plastic and the distribution of plastics so the things that we wanted to focus on were firstly the first step what were the ecological impacts of plastic what are those ecosystem service impacts of plastic and then what does that mean for human health and economic for an, an economic impact and the idea was that by understanding these three different pillars would be really better placed to influence those drivers and to really push forward those interventions uh, that I mentioned on the first slide, which then hopefully in turn will influence uh, and reduce the sources of plastic which are driving the pollution. So um, we did a huge literature review of uh, all of, across the globe. Um, and uh, some key points here is that a lot of the focus of the literature is on entanglement and ingestion. Uh, some on rafting. This is where organisms catch a lift, if you like, with marine plastics and float much further across the sea than you would normally expect. So you see an increase in invasive species. We also saw a lot of focus on birds, fish, mammals, turtles and invertebrates. So this is where most of the literature was. 
There were quite a lot of studies as well on the abundance of plastic. So studies just looking at how much plastic there was out there. So step one, the ecological impact. What did this, this huge, uh, it was more than a thousand points of data that we had. Um, and what did this database, data set of data show us? Uh, quite clearly, the ecological impacts of plastics, and not surprisingly, were really very negative for the majority of the species groups, um, as you, you can see quite clearly by these blue bars on the, on the left-hand side. There was a couple of uh, groups where there was positive impacts. And this is because the, the plastic provided a substrate for these organisms to live on. So bacteria and algae, if there's nothing hard for them to live on, they don't do so well. And that plastics were actually find, providing an environment for these, um, for these particular loose species groups to live on. So they're having a positive impact on these. A takeaway as well from this slide is that we were really very confident in most of these results. There's a lot of work being done on this and we're you know, we're fairly sure this is definitely the case that these negatives and positives are happening. Step two was then how do we translate that ecological information into ecosystem services? So what does that mean for humans and why should we care? So this first, uh, this is a heat map. And if you look on the left hand side, there's a list of five ecosystem services. So these are five benefits which we get from the marine environment. And if you see red along that row, that means that that benefit will be negatively impacted by the plastic. So I would particularly bring your attention here to aquaculture and wild food and the fact that we're looking at really quite negative impacts on those benefits which we're getting from the marine environment. So we're looking at a loss in those ecosystem services. That was the first group of ecosystem services, but there's many more. The second group of ecosystem services we looked at was something called regulating services. And this includes things like climate regulation and waste processing. These other less tangible things, these less tangible benefits that we get from the marine environment. And here I draw your attention to climate regulation and pest and disease control. And both of these look to be negatively impacted by this increase in plastic in the environment and by the plastic pollution. But it's mixed, the picture, and also the pale grey here means we just don't know. So there's a huge amount of unknown here. We don't know how the plastics will affect the amount of carbon the ocean's taken up. We don't know how the plastics are going to affect how the oceans process our wastes. So there's a huge amount of unknown with regard to these benefits that we get from the marine environment. And then the final group of ecosystem services are those relating to what we call cultural services. So these are things like recreation, um, entertainment, tourism. And here we're seeing a huge amount of red. Um, so plastics really negatively impacting these cultural services, which we get. We then thought, if we understand this much, is it possible to take this to the next step and actually value that in a monetary term? So can we come up with, if we're losing all those benefits, what does that mean in a, in a monetary sense? We know from previous research that the ecosystem services that we get from the marine environment are valued at around 50 trillion per year. Um, that's from work done back in 2011. Looking at the heat map and the, re and the research that's behind that, we could see that it was likely that those ecosystem services, those benefits, were probably going to be declining between one and 5%. Um, and if we took that that percentage decline in those benefits that we get from the marine environment, that would lead to an annual loss of between 500 and 2,500 billion in those marine ecosystem services. And that's each year, that's a loss each year. And from this, and looking at the amount of plastic that there is currently in the oceans, we worked out um, that every tonne of plastic that's released and that is in those in the ocean, is likely to be having an impact of between $3,000 and $33,000 um, annually. So that's every single year. And we were hoping that this value would be quite useful in, in, in informing debate and, and actually shifting some of the conversation around this. This is what we might call a social cost of plastics. So this is the social cost for every tonne of plastic. And the work received a, a lot of attention and um, has been really, really taken up. And we're continuing to work on this to refine these numbers. So the three take home points which I'd share with you 
The first one is that if we can understand these social and economic impacts, it, it can be really important. It can help us to target invent interventions. We can work out where we should be prioritizing, where we should be putting our effort, and also really informing those interventions as well. This has been taken up by the Lars just mentioned, the UN Global Negotiations, and this work has been taken up there. It's, it's, it's really helpful um, for governments to understand the fact that uh, they're actually losing out. Continuing to pollute with plastic means a loss to their economies in the broader sense. And the final point is, is a potential win here. If we can reduce the marine plastic in uh, marine plastic pollution, it will actually be an investment in our future provision of marine ecosystem services and the benefits they provide. And I think that's a really important point when we're driving forward those interventions that actually investment now will have positive economic benefit, uh, benefit overall into the future. So that was, I think, uh, yeah, that was all. I'll stop sharing. Great, thank, thank you, so you Nicola. Okay. <laughs> this was super interesting to see how you really span the bridge actually from ecological aspects to societal impacts. So that's very nice to see. And um, I do have a very quick question for you, because as you say, your work has gotten a lot of media attention. And so I was wondering if um, with all this attention, have you been approached by the government or some other stakeholders from policy or did it not happen? Yeah, we work closely uh, in the UK. We have DEFRA, the UK um, Department for Environment. So in fact, they were here yesterday. <laughs> we okay. really work very closely with them. Um, and also with the Norwegian government, I've been working closely with them as well. So, um, yeah, really, really strong uptake, which is nice. And um, the work has been referenced in quite a few of the UN reports and uh, the European Environment Agency as well. So, yeah, good take up and good dialogue. Yeah. OK, nice. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, then again, if the audience has some questions, please post them in the Q&A and we can come back to them later during the session. And I would next like to welcome Luca Nizetto. He is a senior scientist at NIVA, which is the Norwegian Institute for Water and the Environment. And he is going to talk about the scientist's role in the context of making policies. So please, Luca, go ahead. Thank you, Natasha. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, well, the term knowledge society is increasingly used uh, uh, in our lives and in several context and forum. This is, in my opinion, a good description uh, which highlights the growing impact and influence that scientific knowledge has on collective decision making and also individual lives. Uh, we can maybe agree in this context that the term knowledge refers primarily to knowledge generated uh, through the scientific method and its embodiment in technologies. So scientists as creator of primary knowledge play an increasingly important role and seminar role in knowledge societies. Uh, science making encompasses uh, several elements, uh, including science generation and validation that is operated by peer review systems, or uh, in case of non-peer review process, validation is operated by demonstrators, proof of concept, and so on. Uh, the first level of knowledge uh, brokering uh, uh, is what brings the primary knowledge from the creators to the users. Knowledge brokering can be implemented by multiple figures and actors along these paths. Uh, these are uh, experts, practitioners, scientists, innovation managers, academic societies, etc. Uh, knowledge users have uh, here uh, can be businesses, sector organizations such as industry association, farmer organization, but also political organization and NGOs. So knowledge brokers can be understood as persons or organizations that facilitate the creation, sharing, and use of knowledge towards and between these users. Uh, these knowledge brokers work uh, in the public domain as much as in the private domain. And brokering basically involves translation, coordination, and alignment between uh, different perspectives, the perspective of different users. An articulated body of primary knowledge can typically reach a number of different users that may hold the different stakes in a related business, may assimilate knowledge through the lenses posed by their particular utility 
function and values. So there is actually a concrete risk that knowledge changes nature along this path. In societies, uh, acknowledging the concertation of opinions uh, as a tool for policy making, knowledge brokering may proceed from knowledge users to policy makers as part of a multi actor, multi stakeholder negotiation. This is typically what happened at the European Union level, for example, but also a clear example is right now the development of the Global Plastic Treaty through the International uh, Intergovernmental Negotiation uh, Committee. Um, yes, finally, we have uh, uh, a situation where uh, the, this concertation of opinion values and different knowledges brought together by the multiple stakeholders are collectively included into the policy. And we have uh, something, the output is the policy itself that includes assimilated knowledge. Um, I hope you can perceive the importance and relevance of knowledge brokering through this uh, process that shapes our businesses, uh, society, and decision we take for, for the future of the society and the environment. And of course, the context of plastic pollution is particularly relevant here. Now, I would like to put your attention on some interesting component here. As you can see, uh, there are three, three types of knowledges unfolding along, along this flow. Okay, uh, the first one is the primary knowledge we've been talking about, primary and validated knowledge we can cluster as the core scientific knowledge. And then there is brokered knowledge and assimilated knowledge. Broker knowledge and, and assimilated knowledge uh, may have a, a level of deviation from primary knowledge. This is due to bias introduced by knowledge brokers. Uh, this can be wrong assimilation, wrong translation, utility biases, ideological biases, and so on. Uh, I'm stressing this point because I would like uh, to convey the message about the importance of independent scientists responsible for primary knowledge, uh, assuming the rule as a honest knowledge broker. So, the, what is a honest knowledge broker? And what does legitimate primary knowledge creators in participation in good policy making? As you can see here, I listed uh, these uh, seven uh, traits that uh, I believe uh, capture the nature of an honest knowledge broker. Uh, these are independence, transparency, lack of competing interest, documentable credibility, accountability, neutrality, and the ability of confronting ignorance through the precautional principles. So knowledge brokers that are uh, honest, uh, not uh, necessarily are uh, uh, scientists that are responsible for primary uh, knowledge creation. Uh, so not all scientists in generating primary knowledge processes creation possess all these requisites. And also there are honest knowledge brokers that are not scientists. So they, for example, they may possess all these requisites without being knowledge, uh, scientists themselves. Um, but I believe that uh, since there is no such a thing as a, a license or a diploma to be an honest knowledge broker, uh, there is a tendency that independent scientists assume this role. And this is very important because as you can see in this updated model uh, depicted here, this allow uh, knowledge to go through the whole uh, flow in the less uh, biased possible way. And scientists in this way are entitled to contribute also to collective decision making by feeding information into the policy making system. I will give you now some uh, uh, example of uh, current unfolding uh, activities and groups, networks, uh, uh, particularly active uh, in the context of making policies to combat plastic pollution. The first example I want to give you relates to the plastic treaty. Uh, this is the so-called Scientist Coalition. It's a network of over uh, right now 200 international scientists that are uh, actively contributing to the negotiation for the Global Plastic Treaty. 
They offer voluntary in-kind contributions uh, by gathering together in organized working group. They prepare knowledge synthesis, uh, brief, policy brief. Uh, they release opinion uh, across uh, the different domains of the plastic uh, pollution topic. They operate transparently, so they embody the characteristic of a honest uh, knowledge broker uh, as they deliver a declaration of competing interest. Um, and their network is characterized by a strong focus on credibility, accountability, inclusivity. The scientists are from all over the world. Um, it's, I invite you to visit uh, this website to get a uh, better, uh, more detailed uh, description of what the Scientist Coalition is and assess some of the documents they have already provided. A second example uh, I would like to show it's a slightly different. This is uh, the uh, so-called International Knowledge Hub Against Plastic Pollution. This is a knowledge platform created by an expanded group of independent researchers and their institutions. There are some level of connection with the Scientist Coalition. However, uh, ECAP does not target directly the plastic treaty, but uh, does uh, knowledge brokering towards national government practitioners and stakeholders, especially in hotspot countries. So ECAP is particularly active in Southeast Asia in this moment. They possess characteristic of uh, honest knowledge brokers because they are independent. They are financed only through public funds, uh, right now mostly from Norway and Germany. Uh, and their activity includes uh, publishing uh, stories about plastic pollution across thematic areas that you see listed uh, down here. Uh, they release a research brief and also some uh, resources and tools to help uh, practitioner, expert to get a direct grip over the latest knowledge unfolding from research. They also organize uh, thematic webinars. Um, so they privilege honest knowledge brokering over advocacy. This because the, the objective here is not to steer a policy in a direction, but it's just to feed the policy debate with, uh, with uh, um, consolidated and validated scientific knowledge. Final example I want to give you is another of such a stakeholder forum. This is a multi-stakeholder forum uh, working on agricultural plastics. It's a joint venture, <coughs> excuse me, of two research projects financed by independent grants from the European Commission. Uh, involve over 40 research institutes, mostly in Europe. They operate through a multi-actor approach, which means they engage with uh, stakeholders from industry, farmer organization, waste manager, but also policy, policy makers at the European level, mostly, both in knowledge co-generation, but also through direct uh, knowledge dissemination and brokering. Um, this network is also currently active in supporting the Food and Agriculture Organization work towards uh, an international voluntary code of conduct to address agroplastic and in general the impact that plastic pollution can have on soil, terrestrial ecosystem, and the ecological services that provides, including of course agricultural production, food, food production. So this is the last example I wanted to give you. I hope I gave you a short glance on, uh, and some insights on the role that scientists are taking in the context of policy making. And I believe that uh, there are a positive aspect for the society in having honest knowledge broker, although there are also some hindrances that limit uh, the possibility of a scientist, committed scientist, to actively engage in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Um, thanks for introducing the concept of honest knowledge brokers to us. Uh, it's really interesting and also for giving examples such as the Scientist Coalition and ECAP. Um, now, in your last words, you mentioned also the hindrances for scientists to engage in the policy and um, to be honest knowledge brokers. Could you give us some examples of these hindrances? Well, uh, yes, so we've been uh, um, 
very active in several forums. Some of the example I give you, I participate directly. So I'm a natural scientist. I produce knowledge, uh, uh, primary knowledge, but I found myself uh, being involved in a lot of these knowledge broker. And uh, since in many in many contexts where we are engaging with the stakeholder, uh, we we enter into a new area which we, scientists normally are not used is the concertation. And we notice that there is a translational problem in dealing with stakeholders. Some of the stakeholders, like uh, industry present scientists, uh, uh, they are supported by scientists that are employed in their premises. And this interaction are somehow difficult sometimes. And uh, I believe uh, sometimes uh, scientists working on primary knowledge uh, making through independent grants are not uh, do not possess this necessary training to deal into to to delve into these new arenas. Uh, so this is kind of a challenging interaction we have. But uh, I overall I see that uh, this engagement is uh, both useful for the society, for the stakeholders, uh, but also for the scientists that unfold the new research programs that. Uh, can be steered towards the, the needs of uh, policy making, but also the needs of individual stakeholder and knowledge users uh, to steer uh, to steer their action towards more sustainable practices. OK, great. Thank you, Luca. Um, then I would like to move on to our next speaker, which is Gulnush Abasi. So she is a senior scientist at NILU. And she will tell us more about the circularity of plastic polymers by taking Norway as an example. You're still muted, Kolnus. Sorry, I'm uh, working on one. Uh, uh, small screen so uh, I couldn't do this okay. uh, at the same time yeah <laughs> hello uh, yes uh, um, thank you uh, Natasha for organizing this session and uh, everyone for joining this uh, session uh, I'm talking about uh, today um, about the project that we had and uh, bringing uh, um, stakeholder together and try to design for circularity of plastic polymers. And we are looking at the uh, uh, consumption, production consumption and waste management of plastic in Norway. Um, and this project started um, actually with uh, uh, looking at the targets and these uh, when the European strategies and targets like uh, start to coming up. And uh, the first target that we had that 50% of the plastics like uh, must be recycled by 2020, which we didn't reach this target. Then the target moved to 2025 to 55% of plastic packaging to be made of recycled. We are too like far to reach this target and then we move to 2030 the target now is that a hundred percent of plastic packaging must be reusable and recyclable by 2030 but in reality like uh, plastics are reusable must be reusable and recyclable but uh if we can do this or not like that's the main question if like uh, how we can get a uh, plastic product out of a mix polymer plastic that they are heavily contaminated or polluted in the waste stream and how we can bring it back into uh, new and clean products into the market. But then the question is just like, are these uh, economically or technically uh, feasible ways to do this or not? And as of today, we don't have such solution. So what we want to do in this project that was funded by a Norwegian Research Council, we want to bring the knowledge from different stakeholder, producer, consumer and waste collector and also waste recycler to, together and to see if we can uh, kind of close uh, the gap in the broken cycle of plastic. So if we look at uh, the, uh, we map uh, the consumption, production, and uh, application of seven most used plastic polymers in Norway. We identify chemical of concern in different plastic polymers, and then we suggested measures to improve the um, uh, for the 
policy intervention or circular, circular strategies for plastic waste management. So our approach was uh, to look at nine uh, different industrial sector and uh, within that like a 40 product categories and then we look at the polymer fraction of uh, this uh, polymer, uh, polymer used uh, in different plastic products and then we look at the lifespan of the product. So how long does it take for the products staying used or uh, from the time that they come, they put into the market, how long does it take to enter the waste stream? And then for each particular polymer and application, we look at the most uh, chemicals, uh, additive chemicals, like if we use databases to look at the both uh, the um, uh, potential tonnage of use of chemicals and also hazardous risk to come up with some uh, priority uh, scheme uh, if we can uh, uh, prioritize chemical for further regulation. But this is uh, not the focus of this um, talk today. So um, as I said, so we started with uh, uh, MFA material flow analysis to quantify the stock and flow of polymers in our system. It's defined within the boundaries of Norway. We look at these seven uh, most used polymer, which is EPS, HDPE, LDPE, PET, PP, PS, and PVC. And um, uh, so then the input data to this model, it's the um, uh, trade code, uh, so it's about like a 7,600 uh, products, pl plastic products that enter to Norwegian market. And then we look at what has been produced in Norway uh, and uh, within a different industrial sector and also recycled material and how this uh, uh, plastic flow into different sectors. And once they get into waste management, what would be the fate of all these polymers in the waste management? So um, this is uh, the snapshot of the plastic stock and flow in 2020. So from era, all the plastic that they came into the market, which is about 6 million tons. So we see like different stock uh, in different industrial sector and which poly polymers are used in which industrial sectors and what would be the fate in the waste uh, management. Uh, so as we see, like if we have about 6 million ton of plastic like entering the Norwegian market and we have 5 million tons of plastic that we enter the waste management system. And within this, um, if we look at here, so we see that most more than like a 50% has been incinerated. We see that like a, about 25% that have been sent for material recovery or recycling. And as uh, uh, we also saw in like a previous uh, presentation that we still have a considerable flow that uh, uh, is exported from Norway, uh, even even if like uh, most of them we know we send it to Germany or Sweden for uh, further treatment or recycling, but it's still this is an ex export of plastic and like some of them like it may get into somewhere uh, outside of Europe that we do not want, uh, could have a negative environmental social impact. So then we look at the trend of uh, uh, what we modeled. So then uh, the trend of uh, plastic or evolution of the plastic flow. Uh, and this, uh, the first graph here is the polymer put on the market for only the packaging and we have we have like a, these figures for all industrial sectors. So then we see that here, for example, LDP and PP are the most uh, use plastic polymer in packaging and in the second graph here like we see the accumulation of plastic packaging and of course like a, the plastic packaging life span like it's less than one year so we don't see a huge stock of plastic packaging in use but we see that the flow uh, um, the flow to the uh, waste is almost the same as what we put in a market per year and uh, and then we look at like uh, some scenarios of how we can reduce uh, the um, uh, our consumption in the future or uh, how we can uh, reduce the waste generation. So uh, what I forgot to say here that like uh, we have the model from 19. Uh, uh, 1980 here that I'm presenting to 2020, but the projection is a business under the business as usual in the first uh, figure that we are seeing the uh, the projection to 2050 under business as usual. So if uh, based on the per capita consumption or waste generation of plastic and GDP growth. 
So in the in the graph below here, like if we come up with some intervention strategy, so if we reduce the polymer variation, and uh, uh, for example, like if we use LDP and PP rather than all these uh, like other plastic polymers, mainly in so then we can improve the recycling of uh, uh, recycling of plastic waste. Then we see the reduction uh, by 32% of use of plastic polymer in packaging uh, from what it could be in 2050. And then also we look at the other scenarios of if we improve the sorting and recycling of plastic. And then this is like a, if we increase the plastic polymer from uh, um, the packaging, the increase the collection and recycling of um, uh, plastic waste, then we will see like a 5% by 5%, then we are still 60% of what we will generate in 2050. So we are still like a need to mix all these scenarios and have better um, intervention policy to become to 100% of recovering of plastic waste from the waste stream and bring it back into the um, into the market. So with this, like if we come up with uh, like a, some um, how we can implement this result, or what does it mean for circularity of plastic polymers? So now, if we look at for for example for LDPE, and uh, what we generate in a uh, LDPE for plastic waste uh, for in the plastic packaging, then if we can recover whatever we generated as a plastic waste in 2020, this will meet the demand. Like the, the it can uh, supply the demand of. Uh, maybe 60% of plastic packaging for 2021 or 100% uh, 100 of plastic uh, that um, it's required for agricultural demand in 2021. And also for PET. So if we collect like uh, PET that we, we in a uh, that we generated uh, in a packaging waste, if we collect the 100 uh, that like 100% of that, then it would meet the demand of 70% of the demand in 2021. And for HDPE, like this is the best polymer to be reused and a lot of the uh, personal carrier product or detergent product like they are made of HDPE. And if they are all harmonized and use the same type and like the same color, then we can we can reuse uh, most of this packaging product. So then if we collect everything that we put in, uh, we generate as a waste in 2020, then it would be 15 kilotons of HDPE that we can recover from the waste stream to reuse. And these are like a very reusable polymer. So some take home message from uh, uh, our results. So we should look at the uh, polymer. Polymers are different. Like uh, it's not only plastic, like we have to target polymer per industry, per application to uh, create uh, um, uh, meaningful targets. And then there are differences within each sector that there are matters. And we have about one fourth of our sorted waste is exported outside of Norway and demand for recycled is still too low for a material. Uh, uh, it's still very low. Um, so with this, uh, I want to thank you for your attention and all our partners and also the Research Council for funding this project and uh, my co authors for this work. And if you have any question, please contact us. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Gunush. Um, this was just to say Sorry. we still see your screen. Yeah. Um, this was really nice to see also some finally some concrete numbers actually about uh, plastic circularity and also that you consider the feasibility of it, which of course is a huge aspect. Um, you also mentioned in the end how harmonization of plastic products could really make a difference. And I think that's very interesting and sort of links actually maybe to our last speaker of today, um, who is Vida Niehammer, and he's the general manager of NCMT. So this stands for Norwegian Circular Materials Technology. And I think he's going to say us what this means exactly and he's also going to present us a converter's perspective on change so please Vida, go ahead yes can you hear me yes thanks yes good and you can see the screen as well we had some issues earlier yes oh great 
So thank you for the introduction. Yes, as you said, I'm the manager of NCMP, which is uh, an industry association for the polymer and composite industry of Norway. Uh, and as you also said, I'm here to give the converters perspective and uh, on how to actually turn the increased demands for sustainability and circular economy into actual changes in production. And the Norwegian plastic uh, industry consists mainly of converters. There are just a couple of raw material producers. This is a thing to keep in mind. Uh, and it's also to keep in mind that raw material producers are in general quite big, while the converters are often so small, uh, often quite small. So uh, you, of course, have exceptions in aerospace, automotive, uh, and wind industry, but they are exceptions. In NCMT, about 90% of our members are SMEs and our members spread out across uh, most of the different plastic materials and they deliver, uh, deliver products and services to a wide range of industries. And to give you an even better understanding of our members, we'll quickly look into just a few financial numbers as well. Our 70 members, they have a total revenue of about two and a half billion euros, uh, which leads to an average just short of 50. However, some of our largest members are pushing this average quite high. So if you look at the median revenue, this uh, of about seven and a half million euros, this gives a more correct picture of the size of our members and also their financial opportunities and solidity. And this is very important when we're talking about the ability to change and uh, to develop. Now I'm just going to highlight some of our members so you know a bit who we're talking about and what we're talking about. So it can be the raw material producers that we have, for instance, uh, producing polyester or PVC, but most of our members uh, are converters, for instance, making electric passenger ferries, uh, enclosed fish farming, long pipes, sporting equipment, gas tanks, uh, airplanes or subsea structures. And as you see, we're dealing with quite a lot of different companies in, in NCMT, and our role is to find out what these ones have in common, uh, what challenges they face, and facilitate collaboration that can lead to actual change. Being in contact with the industry stakeholders every week, I'm working on getting a better understanding of the driving forces for change. And a key takeaway is that governance is very important. If there are no policies uh, or new laws or regulations pushing you to make a change, it's both convenient and predictable to stay as you are. Changes often come with the combination of uncertainties and investments. This is often a challenge, especially if you're an SME. And we're gonna look a bit closer at those two. Um, reducing uncertainties can be done in many ways. Uh, updated and precise standards can, for instance, give uh, converters a very good framework to develop within. And there is a surge of new environment related standards in the pipeline at the moment. These will definitely decrease the uncertainties. Um, and another example from the composite part of the plastic, uh, I want to mention something big happening right now as we speak. Because for years, we've had Euro codes for steel, timber, concrete, masonry, etc., giving a common approach for structural design of buildings and other civil engineering. But no, uh, no Euro code for composites, not before now. This year, a technical specification was published. Uh, this is like an early stage of a Euro code waiting for its final approval after a trial time. So in a few years, we'll hopefully have this common framework in place for building with composites. Uh, then converters that are, uh, for instance, trying to replace steel beams with lighter composite beams won't then have to fight both the market and also at the same time persuade the buyer that their product is actually made from a legitimate construction material. However, the Euro codes are not normally linked to sustainable development, but in this case, I argue that it actually is. Uh, just mentioning one example is the weight reduction from changing from steel to composites can significantly reduce the CO2 footprint from transport of the building materials. And by that, I think we've covered governance for now, and I'll jump over to another driver, which is financial incentives, uh, which is a driver I would like to make some changes to, uh, or actually maybe just reinforce, I would say. Because there is a lot of funding available for both national collaborations, European collaborations, 
collaborations that involve groundbreaking research and development and that come up with extraordinary solutions. And this is extremely important. And I, of course, support this. But today, taking the perspective of an SME converter, I have the following statement, at least for Norway. It is too hard to find funding for sustainable changes that do not include groundbreaking research. The pressing matter to reduce emissions for an SME converter might not be to engage in research projects to develop something new and groundbreaking. It might be that what they need is to try out a new production method or to buy a new machine without risking too, uh, losing too much income because the testing phase will slow down the production. Funding, funding big research projects is enormously important, but don't forget that we also need to help the industry take new solutions into their manufacturing. And remember, 90% of the industry companies are SMEs. The last topic I want to cover is collaboration. As a plastic converter, you mainly communicate one step up and one step down in the value chain. When it comes to things that are further away in the value chain, you most likely don't have any influence. You can wish for someone to come and pick up your production waste and turn it into a new product, or, and you can hope that someday someone comes up with a business model that will use your end-of-life product as their main feedstock. But if you want to do more than just wishing and waiting, you have to widen out your circle of contacts, find partners, start communicating and sharing, because now you've entered an area where you're not fully in control anymore, like waste handling. In Norway, municipalities have the responsibility for consumer waste. 354 municipalities, 354 different ways of handling waste. The industry, though, is responsible for its own waste, uh, but mainly using the same uh, waste handling actors as the municipalities. To illustrate uh, what can be challenging about a system like this and why it's challenging to develop circular economy uh, in a system like this, I'm going to do a very general example. Company A, B, C, and D, they have 10 tons of the same plastic waste. They deliver their waste to waste handling companies, one, two, three, and four. These companies, they don't specialize in plastics, but they know that they need 40 tons to make profit from delivering it to a recycler. So with only 10 tons each, two of them decide to send the waste out of Norway and to incinerate it. What if a bright mind knew that there was 10 tons located in four different places and could calculate the trans transportation costs, gathering these resources and sending them to be recycled? What if this was a very bright mind, uh, then she might already have thought about, uh, thought about a way to use this plastic, uh, the recycled material, and then she might have created a new business model and a new business could have been born. In NCMT, we're currently working on this, exactly this. We are gathering the industry and we are mapping the waste. We'll first map, uh, map our members' production waste and display it to those with circular ambitions. So they have a tool uh, that can lead them to know how much uh, materials you find in which regions uh, and of which type of materials, uh, then we'll allow those bright minds into our system and we will facilitate the increase of circularity. The system will eventually extend to include end of life products, sector by sector, reducing the pollution and emissions, increasing the circularity. The main point here is that this systemic approach isn't something a converter can do on its own. But making systems to develop circular value chains across regions or whole countries is a very important factor for enabling converters to be more circular and for facil facilitating actual change in production. So summing up, uh, I can say that as a representative of the converters in Norway, NCMT is welcoming the approach of the United Nations Environment Programme trying to re reduce pollution by regulating production. This might be the way uh, to lead us away from putting out fires everywhere and into a more systemic approach to reduce pollution and emissions. In the beginning, it might hurt, but in the long run, I believe that this is the only thing that will benefit our industry, our nature, the environment and the climate. And by welcoming UNEP's approach, we also both would like to and demand to be included in the construction of this new industry framework. 
Plastics are complex, as we've heard today. The same materials can cause devastating pollution in some places, but they can also create sustainable solutions other places. So uh, the only way to create uh, regulations and a system that will actually enhance sustainability is by working together with open cards, both authorities, researchers, policymakers, and the industry. And by that, I say thank you very much. Thank you, Vida. This was uh, really great. And uh, I think we're all thankful that you're here today because this is really what we need to bring together stakeholders from science and society uh, and politics, but also from industry. Um, so this was really nice to see. And I would say we start now with the plenary discussion. We have about 20 minutes left. And um, so we are keeping, Miguel and I are keeping an eye on the Q&A, but the audience so far is still quite silent. <laughs> um, but maybe some questions will come up during the discussion. Um, also for you speakers, if you have a question to one of the other speakers, please don't hesitate to do so. So, or if you want to react to the answer of one of the speakers, um, please do so, just raise your hands and um, yeah. So to start with, I think, Miguel, you have a question. Yeah, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of the presentation when Lars was talking about uh, one way that we could address greenhouse gas emissions is to shift towards productions of um, um, substitutes, for, substitutes for plastics and for, for um, plastics that come from fossil uh, sources. And I would like you ask you and, and any, any other one from the panel that might want to answer to it, like how could we ensure that renewable materials used as substitutes are both environmentally sustainable and economically, economically viable to just not take into account greenhouse gas emissions, but other environmental impacts that actually in terms of plastics are also very, very relevant uh, as Nicole also present. So if you Lars wants to answer or if someone else wants to answer this. No, I'll be happy to Miguel if, 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 if you allow me Natasha. I think it's a it's a really, really good point because there's a lot of lot of talk about bio-based plastics as the solution. And it's by intention that we only mention it as one of three solutions because of course with bio-based plastics you will in all likelihood have less greenhouse gas emissions but you're going to have other issues. First of all, you're going to have the issue of competing for land to produce plastics, unless you produce it from waste. And secondly, you're going to have issues uh, related to, to land use and water use. So you're absolutely right. By shifting from conventional plastics to bio-based plastics, you will have other environment uh, rental issues. And I think those have to be exactly as you say, Miguel, those have to be considered together. And there has to be much more assessment about you know what the pros and cons are of of conventional versus uh, versus bio-based plastics. So I fully agree on that point. That's we shouldn't see it as like a magic bullet that can solve everything, but more as part of the solution. I would say. Um, and now I'm seeing that Luke. I was asking to Vitara if you wanna. Just pick up and ask him directly. That's also okay for us. Oh yes, thank you, Miguel. Uh, yes, uh, I agree that inventorizing plastic uh, waste generation is crucial for for businesses to make more sustainable business models. It's crucial for authorities to design uh, environmental protection measures and regulations. It's useful for scientists to to address some scientific question, provide useful information that can be then back fed into, into the stakeholders. However, this disclosure means also disclosing potentially sensible marketing information, which may actually impact uh, the interest of some business. So I see this, uh, for example, in the plastic agricultural plastic sector, where I'm, I'm developing my research, that is a major issue. Uh, so a lot of important data that in, at the end possibly will be required uh, as a disclosed open data by the plastic treaty after reading the zero draft yesterday. Disclosing this data is not always easy for enterprises, right? Do you see any way out from this conundrum? 
Um, it is a big challenge. There's uh, creating this culture of sharing uh, in the industry because the uh, what people are used to is to protect your own information. Uh, but it's, I believe in show, uh, that there should be a way of showing the benefits of sharing information. So if you contribute by sharing the information, you should have some sort of reward. I don't have a solution to how that reward <laughs> is, but uh, uh, that is sort of the like uh, umbrella answer. Uh, but I think by also uh, being cautious about how you display the information, uh, it doesn't mean that like if you report how much waste you have uh, that it will be displayed and used against you directly. Uh, and everyone have access to it. You can collect it and you can display it in a way that a waste handling actor can get an overview and you can uh, a government or a researcher can get an overview and without sort of undressing uh, the secrets of uh, the companies. So I think uh, to start displaying it in, a, uh, in sort of like a conservative way in the beginning and then as the culture for information sharing is developing, you can start making it all more and more transparent. Thank you. Um, and also following up with, with, in, with industry and how industry could engage into these measures, uh, I wanted to hear from Nicola, what does you think that could make business engage and to recognize in final the risk of plastic pollution because you said that there was a uh, like media and policymakers were were catching up on on your work uh, but how could I, I don't have a really clear phrasing for the question but we saying that there is a financial risk of plastic pollution and it impacts all of us even industry but how could we make the link between okay industries are are producing how do they engage and, and to try to tackle the, these financial risks and incentivize them to take more sustainable practices. So I think it's really important to be constructive in these discussions and that they need to be undertaken collaboratively with industry rather than sort of at industry. That's absolutely key. I think that we're seeing um, industry respond really positively to these challenges already. I think FIDO has made a really you know, good case for this. And this is what I've seen already is that in a lot of ways, they're not sitting and waiting for regulation to come in. They they can see this is happening and they can see that there's a want and need for this. So there is a general, there's a shift anyway without needing direct intervention. Um, that said, I think that exploring those costs of the plastic, I think that per tonne value, we found with the situation around CO2 and carbon, that having a per ton value for carbon, for example, has been really helpful in, in sort of shifting the market a little bit in its activity. And I think that we'll probably have a similar, it, it can play a similar role here with this with the plastic, but it's just one tool amongst many. Um, and I think that it should be used as one tool amongst many. And I'm not in any way advocating that uh, plastic tax, for example, would be the best way forward. I think it's something that should be explored. I think financial interventions such as plastic credits are something that should be also explored. Um, but I, I think the most important thing is to do, like I say, is to do this collaboratively with industry. Industry is sometimes, I think, from an environmental perspective, can be seen almost as the bad guy in this. And I think that is a really, really unhelpful um, approach and also inaccurate. Uh, so I, I, I think that that's a key thing to keep in mind. Thank you very much. And Vidar, do you have any comments following up on, on this? Well, I also see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, no. I, I, I think she said it quite well, actually. And I also uh, just want to just uh, also say that I really agree with the last thing you said about the industry not uh, shouldn't be see, looked at as the bad guys because they are currently now uh, trying to uh, do this transition and. 
I can see like genuine engagement among industry actors trying to actually change the way they run their uh, their companies, their factories, where they source their materials. They're looking into ways to actually get their materials recycled. Even like boat uh, manufacturers that produce in uh, carbon, they produce carbon fiber boats. Uh, they haven't had a single boat taken out of production yet since they started manufacturing in the 70s. So they don't have any end of life waste yet, but they're looking uh, like really far into what to do with this when it's coming. Uh, but uh, for now, it isn't really a problem, but they are actually taking uh, measures already. So I think the industry uh, has uh, realized that something is happening and they're uh, they're on their way. That is something great to hear. <laughs> Many things. I'm gonna ask you again, but I would also like I would also like to hear from Lars about this. Uh, do, are you aware of because you were you were pointing out that uh, SMIs they don't they might not have the capacity to engage into investment that might drive drive them to to produce more sustainable because that's only kind of uh, research grants that are might be too big for them. Are you aware of any other innovative innovative finan financial models that could be? helpful for them could be implemented or or are yeah maybe somewhere else because you're working with with Norwegian partners maybe somewhere else you're aware that it already exists or something like that um, first I want to see that uh, say that uh, I really want SMEs to engage in research and I want them to collaborate with the researchers uh, and they they also do uh, but uh, the problem is that this they can get funding for and they can uh, do this because we have a well-established system through the Norwegian Research Council, partially Innovation Norway. Uh, but for those SMEs uh, that actually just need this new machine to take one more step in terms, terms of sustainability, they can't take the risk on their own, but they need someone to sort of help it a bit. For this, uh, I don't really know about any uh, funding that is, uh, I don't know, publicly known. Uh, and you can argue that the, this is the private sector and they should take responsibility for their own finances and their own funding, but still it's SMEs, they're quite small. You can, uh, they're actually so small that if you come with a truck and you deliver uh, something to this company, you might meet the CEO receiving the truck. Uh, and then he goes back into his office and he acts as, as the CFO and helps out in the production later. So uh, they are quite small and they need a little uh, bit extra help. Uh, but to answer your questions, I don't really know about any funding like this. Nice, thank you. I would have a quick question for Gulnush. Um, because I mentioned it because it really was interesting to me what you said in the end about the harmonization of plastic products and that this could really help to increase circularity a lot. And so I was wondering, is this something you and the science community have come up with as part of a solution? And do you know if there's also incentives from the policy side um, or motivation from the industry side <laughs> to do this? Because it seems like a very uh, actually easy solution, so to say, for just a part of the problem, of course, but yeah. Yes, this has been reflected uh, in many scientific work that we need to reduce the variation in polymer use and also the chemical use in plastic. So then the fact that like, if you are using 10,000 chemicals as an additive into different polymers like to get certain properties for polymer or plastic products, like this itself reduce the recyclability of the plastic polymer. So we need to have like a more harmonized system to know which chemicals are safe to use and which polymers are better to use to be able to have like a more better quality of recycled. And this has been said in from different approach, like a bit different uh, uh, polymer scientists or chemists. But unfortunately, and we had uh, um, like a few meeting with uh, policymakers, and this has not been so far like picked up as a measure to uh, for improving the uh, the plastic. But uh, it has been communicated. Yes, Lars, I appreciate your response here. 
No, sorry, there was on something else on, on, on Miguel's uh, previous point. So just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but then that would be uh, interesting just like to hear your point and uh, like uh, how how we can regulate like on some measures that it would not it would still allow industry to have their products, but then it would just like a kind of guide them through what it's better for the waste management, how we can how in, can how we can improve the collection, sorting and also recycling of plastic. Maybe if I can come in on that and, and to Miguel's point, I think on the, on the financing, maybe yeah. that's the biggest challenge we are facing right now. Really, a big lack of financing for the SMEs. You know, Vida was saying, I don't know a lot of findings. I don't know either. And the and the issue is that you know, there's some public financing, not a lot. Some from foundations, but I think we need the big investors to come here and 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 finance this. And this is a hindering for the SMEs but also for the research. I don't think I've worked in an area before where there was so much lack of knowledge. Yeah? You know, we know of the problem of, of microplastics, but we won't know 100 of the problem. And, and what you were referring to, Golnius, that this whole mix of all these polymers and mixing all the chemicals together, all the consequences of that, we, we know too little about it. Huh? So I really think that one of the primary solutions is to get a lot of financing into this. And I and really hope that the, the global treaty will help that at least to point investors in that direction, because if, without the investment, I think it's going to be difficult to challenge or to, to to solve all these problems and get, you know, get only only plastic for what we need plastic for to get more reuse, to get more recycling, and and and, and the whole package of solutions. Please go on. Yes, uh, thank you. That's a very good point. And I just want to ask this question to Nicola, like uh, how we can bring this financing back to the producer of plastic, like uh, how we can work on this model, like together perhaps, uh, that like we can bring this uh, burden, like from societal uh, pressure to uh, the upstream stakeholder. So I think we can use a, a range of methods for this. One of the things I mentioned earlier was this idea of a plastic tax, but there's a lot of anxiety, I think, and concern around this. You'd have to be done very, very carefully. Um, a, another thing is this um, around the idea of having some kind of plastic credits in the same way that we've had biodiversity credits and carbon credits in the past. And that almost you could set up a market for these, which I think is another really interesting um, idea. I think one of the things we've learned from the past is the importance of any mechanism, any financial mechanism that you bring in is that you trial it first and you take time, you know, to make sure that it's acceptable to people. I, I mean, a, a sort of slightly different tack that we're taking is looking also at behaviour change. So looking at consumer behaviour. So the conversation here is very much around the producers, but actually a lot of what the producers do is driven by the consumers who are using those products. So I think it can be also useful to look, you know, at a different from this, at this from a slightly different angle. And we've been looking at, at, at the reasons people make the choices they make as consumers and what would be required for them to shift some of their behavior and, and some of the choices which they are making. So I think it's about taking quite a, a broad look at, at, at this really a, across the suite and also learning from global pollutants we've tackled in the past. So We've, we have tackled pollutants like sulfur dioxide and carbon um, and CFCs in the past using a range of different methods. And these can be anything from using financial incentives to behavior change to outright bans. And I think drawing on some of that past experience with those other pollutants, uh, it, it can be really important here. Um, yeah, I think like a one of the different, sorry that I um, jump here, but then uh, it's like when we're talking about like an acute uh, hazardous um, factor versus like a potential hazardous. So then like the, the action will be much slower and this is like what we see for plastic. But if if the financial uh, burden will be unmanufactured and that would like a kind of uh, go uh, along the supply chain. So then the cost will be on the consumer. So plastic will be much more expensive than what we do, but then we can finance the uh, waste management. But then we also consume less because it will be more expensive to consume. Like if we don't, we, like this cheap plastic are also the headache in the waste management, right? 
But I think if you enforce these tasks, the, the tax directly on the producers, it's it's not that simple. I can see that it might look that simple that you just make them all all pay more. But that what you'll do then is it, it can have quite a perverse effect on the market, and it won't always have the effect that you're wanting to, to see. I think the difficulty is that the plastics are incredibly diverse. So we're saying tax people who work with plastic. I mean, realistically, then you're you're taxing pretty much like almost everything like plastic is everywhere we use it all the time and the other thing is is that the fact that the plastics is cheap is is actually really beneficial for a lot of people so it, it, it gives us chance to um to take a couple of examples to provide healthcare solutions that are affordable it gives us a chance to keep food fresh for longer if all of a sudden you were to enforce a universal tax on all plastic you would see probably some really negative effects on human health and well-being as a result. You'd see people paying and suffering who were not the kind of people that you would be hoping to target. So I think that it, it, it sounds neat as an idea of plastic tax, um, but I think the reality of it is, is much more complicated. Um, and I think that's why you have to handle it quite carefully. And we've seen this happen before where we, we, we go in with with quite strong sort of command and control measures um, towards making the polluter pay. Uh, and, I, and, and I fully think, you know, this is a, an avenue that we do need to explore more fully. And I think we are. I think there are steps being taken along that route. Um, but it does need to be done with a, a, degree of, a degree of caution. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, Vida, please react. And then shortly we will need to wrap up, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, please just, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just want to support that uh, what you said about that we have to use caution in terms of regulating and these things. We need regulation. Uh, it's really important, but no shortcuts. Uh, as in the plastic packaging, it's uh, when we've been talking about plastic packaging today, when it has been mentioned, it has been taken for granted that this is the plastic around the cucumber. But this is the uh, non-durable plastic that is just thrown away and ends up in the ocean. Uh, and this is also the reason why we have uh, uh, regulations now for how much le the requirement for the content of recyclates or bio-based materials in the plastic packaging. But one of my members have met actually some troubles with this because they are producing plastic packaging, a gas container in uh, composite materials. So they have a vinyl ester and uh, glass fiber, and they need to meet the, uh, the same requirements as the plastic around the cucumber. Uh, and this leads to that they don't get the same uh, sort of green finance opportunities as if they would have uh, managed to meet these requirements because they can't, uh, because it's about safety. It's a gas that can explode. But still, they uh, they make a significant contribution in terms of CO2 when replacing steel, because these are containers that are moved out, moved around a lot. They have a circular uh, approach that they're refilled and reused, etc. Uh, and they're making uh, so they're saving so much CO2 by reducing the weight of steel to composites uh, that they uh, save a lot of CO2. Right, so. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't take any shortcuts when regulating. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Vida, for this <laughs> last words. And I uh, think we are lucky on this that plastic is not only bad, it has advantages, um, but it has challenges. And we need to work together in order to tackle these challenges and problems. Um, so. Unfortunately, we need to wrap up. I would love to listen to you for the rest of the day, but I know that you also have um, other, other meetings coming up. Um, I've seen some activity in the chat now, so that's great. And I would like to thank all the audience for attending, but especially, of course, um, all the speakers for taking the time, presenting their works and uh, participating in the discussion. And I would also like to thank Miguel and Gulnush for helping me to organize the session. And um, yes, hopefully we can meet again <laughs> in one of these setups. So thank you, everyone, and um, have a nice thank afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.